turn to the beginning of the end. Um, we have a uh, so we have a, only you know slightly less than half the semester left, um, but in terms of like all the components of you know, the whole system that we've been talking about, all the way from you know circuits all the way up to high level language, we've only got like it's a lot less than half of it that's left. But that's in some sense the most complicated part. So we're going to spend a while on it. Um, so just to um, kind of recap where we are, where we're going. Um, so on this side, I've got. Oh, let's use it. Um, I've got Jack programs. Right. So programs written in some kind of high-level language. Um, you know. So maybe like you know if. X is less than five. And let y equal twenty-three. Something like this. And uh, where we eventually want to get to is VM programs. Right. So we'll eventually translate this into something like, in this case, I don't know. Uh, you know, maybe like push local zero, push constant five LT, you know, is it like if go to something, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and from this point on, right, we, we know how the rest of the story goes, right? We translate virtual machine programs into assembly, which gets assembled into machine code, and then that gets run on circuits, et cetera. Okay. So this is the only kind of step of the process that we haven't done yet. Um, so basically translating from Jack programs to virtual machine programs, so it's actually uh, broken it into four projects worth of stuff, right? So this is it's, it's written on the, it's a little confusing. It's called like projects 10 slash 11 A, B, C, D. And the reason that we did it that way um, is that your book organizes it a little differently into two projects, 10 and 11. Um, but we basically, I say we because like actually Dr. Fair did most of the work. I'm just using what he did, which is, which is great. Um, uh, like, Instead of like doing all of project 10, which is, I'll talk about what that would be in, in 11, it's like we're doing a little bit of both kind of in four stripes, as it were. Um, so this is 10, 11, A, B, C, D. And then there are going to be two more projects after that, project uh, 12, A and B, which is the operating system. Um, which is not, which is kind of its own thing. It's not really part of this translation process, but it means that we can write uh, Jack programs that are a little more sophisticated because um, it provides some stuff for us. Okay, so um, how does this work? Um, so I should. Uh, I should say that really when I wrote my example Jack program, I was cheating a little bit. Um, because as humans, as programmers, we look at that and we see an if statement. Right? There's an if statement and there's like a you know condition in there, there's a let statement, right? We kind of see the high level the high level structures there, right? That's not what a compiler sees. A compiler sees a string. Okay? So I really should have written it something more like this, you know, if, and then I'm going to put this little thing to represent a space character, you know, less than five space. Actually, let's put like a comment here because we have to deal with comments too. Uh, you know, and then like, and then there's like a new line character and then some more spaces. 
let you know space y like blah blah blah. So this is really what we're dealing with as input, right? And so really part of the job is to start from this and actually translate it into something structured, like the way we like to think about it in terms of oh this is an if statement, it has this condition, it's got this statement inside of it. Um, so that's that's gonna be part of our job. So how does this usually work? Um, there's lots of ways to do this. There's not like only one way to do it, but typically the way it's done, even this is done in several phases. Um, and this is just one of those things like, you know, I'm gonna tell you and you're like, well, why do you have to do it that way? It's like, well, we don't have to, but people have been writing compilers for literally 70 years, and this is the way that everyone typically agrees is a nice way to do it, right? Um, if you tried to write a compiler that literally just took a string as input and you just tried to like go to the string and and just kind of like write some if statements <coughs> and figure out you know how to translate into this, it would it would be a horrible mess. That's kind of how we've done the other translators, right? It's just like all right, let's look at it line by line. Let's you know look at this line of code, see what does it look like. Then I figure out you know what assembly to output or whatever. Um, but this is not going to work that way. So the first step. Um, Uh, we're going to translate it into something called a token stream. The idea here is, well, right, this is just a bunch of characters, right? But some of these characters kind of go together. So, for example, uh, like the I and the F, those go together. Those are one thing, right? It's just the word if. Um, I don't have, I shouldn't have to worry about the fact that it's like two separate characters later. It's just a thing if. And then like the parentheses is a thing. This x is a thing, and if if this was a variable name that was longer, so maybe I should have used, let's call it like you know, uh, x x, right? Just to emphasize that like <clears throat> it could be multiple characters, and I have to say, oh, that's that's all one thing. That's a variable name, right? And like this two and three, those go together. That's one thing, okay? So we have this idea of like kind of atomic chunks of characters that go together that kind of you can't split up, and those are called tokens. Okay, So the token stream is, a, is conceptually a list that's something like this, right? It's like the keyword if, and then it's a parentheses, and then it's the variable xx, and then it's a, you know, a less than, and then the number five, um, and so on. Okay, So it's still not structured in the sense of you know, at this stage, I don't know, I'm not thinking of it in, in terms of like this is an if statement with a let inside of it. It's just a sequence of tokens, but at least I don't have to deal anymore with, you know, the fact of having individual characters. I kind of separated into one of the smallest uh, pieces. So this is called, so these are called tokens, which is like, you know, smallest, uh, how should I define this? Smallest uh, independent units of input. And this step is called tokenization. It's also called lexing or lexical analysis. Sometimes you'll see people call it scanning. I like, I, there's a lot of words that get used for this, but it's, it's all the same thing. Um, and I didn't leave myself quite enough space here. Let's, let's actually delete this. Let's do... So the next step, <coughs> is where we actually figure out the structure of the input, right? So I don't want to think of it just as a linear sequence of symbols. I want to think of it as this is an if statement, and the if statement contains a condition, and it contains another statement which might contain further things, right? So conceptually, I want to think of it as some kind of tree. So this is called an uh, AST, well, it's an abstract syntax tree. AST, 
which looks something like this, conceptually. You know, it's like, well, it's an if. And the if has two things inside of it. The first is the condition, and the second is, you know, the body of what's inside the if. And what is the condition? Well, the condition is an expression that's a less than applied to two arguments. It's applied to the variable x, x, and the number five. And then the statement inside the if is a let, um, you know, which uh, itself has two things. It's like the variable y and the number 23. Something like this. So this step, going from a stream of tokens to an abstract syntax tree, is typically called parsing. And then this step, of course, is code generation. So, uh, in your book, like, this stuff is project 10, and this stuff is project 11. But it's really boring and unmotivating to do all of the parsing completely without ever having it output any code. Like, you can't actually run it. You just, like, are outputting a bunch of, you know, some trees. So, um, what we're going to do is, um, I don't know, use like magenta. Mm -hmm. So this actually, uh, so, so project A actually is just the tokenization. So we are going to have that as a separate project, but then like basically, C or B, C, and D. Right, so like project 1011B is going to say, all right, <laughs> you have to only, you only have to handle like, you know, if, and you have to be able to handle, you know, let. I made that up. I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's something like that. It's like, don't worry about all the other language features. We're just going to be able to handle these things. And so you have to make sure that you can parse those things, and then you have to make sure that you can generate code for them. And then you'll be able to run you know, run them on these sample test programs that only use those features of the language, and it should work, right? And then, you know, Project C says, all right, now we're going to add classes, and we're going to add, you know, we're going to, like, keep adding things. And even within these projects, you'll see that it's broken down, like, here's a test that only does, you just add this thing, and then you it just add this thing. So it's much more motivating, I think, and, and fun uh, to, like, get it to work end-to-end -end on something very small, and then you add more features incrementally. So that's what we're going to do. Um, any questions? All right. So uh, what I want to do today then is we're just going to focus on this this uh, tokenization step because that's what you're going to do for um, project 1011a, um, which officially 1011a is due this Friday. Um, of course, you can you know there's extensions, but officially that is when it's due, and that's actually these these are like. It, they're, they're not one per week. Like some of the, in, in the past, mostly we've been like doing one project per week. These, the official due dates of these are a little bit more squished together. Um, but you know, it's like, I don't know, in terms, of, in terms of how it compares to the previous projects, I think it's less than four, you know, it's definitely not like twice as much work as project seven and eight combined. But it's, but it's more than, it's more than seven and eight. So I, I don't know. It's like, whatever. Um, it, it certainly is reasonable, especially after what we go over today, that you could finish this one by Friday. 
um, if you wanted to. Um, so we're gonna. <laughs> so today, oops. Today, we're gonna do tokenization for a simple example language. Okay, so we're going to make up a very simple language that's kind of a, a very simple subset of the Jack language. And I'm going to walk through, we're going to, you know, we'll write it together. I'll, I'll write some Python code up on the screen, and we'll actually develop a whole tokenizer for it. And you're welcome to use that code kind of as the, the start for your um, 1011a. So what's going to be in our language? Um, our language is going to have, um, it's going to have variables. It's going to have uh, integers, uh, only positive integers, which actually I don't even think. I think the Jack language does not have negative numbers, if I recall correctly. Of course, you can always say like zero minus something if you like. Like the the syntax of the language doesn't have negative numbers. The semantics of the language, certainly, of course, we can have negative numbers in our programs, but you cannot write a negative number in a program. You, have to, you would have to say, like, 0 minus whatever. Um, so we only have positive integers. Variables, integers, we'll have, like, uh, addition, subtraction, and multiplication, and uh, maybe division, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Um, we'll have parentheses. And uh, we'll have uh, let let statements. Um, that's it. That's all we're gonna. Oh, and comments. Because comments are kind of part of the interesting part. Actually, I didn't say this. I should have said this earlier. Um, I guess I didn't get far enough with my token stream to show this. But the the idea is that comments don't show up in the token stream at all. Because they're not really they're not really part of the program. Right? They're just to be ignored. And so this is, the, this is the point at which we ignore comments. Um, there's really no point in carrying them any further because they don't add anything. Um, so, so we're going to have comments in our example language to show how that works because that's a, an important part of tokenizing. Um, you know, so for example, I can have a program that says, you know, let, um, you know, x5 equal y plus 99, you know, and then I'll have a comment, and then, you know, let z equal x5 plus 3 um, times, you know, uh, y minus 7. Something like this. So the only programs we'll be able to write in this little example language is just like a sequence of assignment statements where we do arithmetic. Okay, so kind of boring, but um, that's going to get us most of the interesting things. So some particular things that I'm not including that you'll have to figure out yourself um, for the real Jack language are strings. So you can, the Jack language can have like strings and double quotes. So you got to figure out how to do those. Um, the Jack language also has multi-line comments where you have like slash star and then a star slash somewhere else. Um, so you'll be doing that. Um, and it's going to have a bunch more keywords and um, operators and stuff like that. But, um, so let me just uh, talk about this example program for a second. So this, of course, is a comment. So we don't care about that. We'll get rid of that. Um, the word let is a keyword. What is a keyword? A keyword is a special, is a word that has a special meaning in that programming language. And typically, you cannot name variables with the same name as a keyword, right? So you couldn't have a variable called let. It would, it would, it would say it would yell at you, right? And you probably encountered this writing programs in whatever language, if you try to use some special word as a variable name, it yells at you and says, no, you can't use the word if as the name of a variable or whatever. Um, these are 
Um, you know, all of these things. These are variables, or the kind of more uh, technical term for these is identifiers, um, because there's more things than just variables, right? You could have like the name of a class, or yeah, that's not really a variable, right? But it's not it's not something that's specially built into the language. It's just a name that you made up. And so that would be an identifier as well. Um, and then we're gonna, we're, we have some like, you know, some symbols, all these things, the parentheses, right? These are all symbols. I'll let you read that. Um, and, uh, you know, then we also have some numbers here, some hints. So I think those are all the different types of uh, tokens that we have in this language, right? I mean, very, uh, comments don't count, we're gonna get rid of that, and then we've got keywords, identifiers, symbols, and ints. And the symbols are always one character, and uh, Jack very carefully does that, so if you, you might recall like how in Jack, if you wanna test whether things are equal, you actually use a single equals, and there's a few other, and it doesn't have like less than or equal to, it makes you write, you know, not greater than or something. Part of the reason is to make this tokenization easier. If you see a non-letter character, you're just like, yep, that's just a symbol, and I, I don't have to look at anything past that because I know we only have one letter symbol. Um, it's not that much harder to have multi-character symbols, but it does require a little bit more work. All right, I guess these are symbols. The semicolons are symbols too, I suppose. Okay, any questions at this point? So our goal is to, we're gonna write a Python class that will will give it like something like this as a just a giant string. And then we're gonna be able to say, <coughs> hey, what's the current token? What kind of token is it? You know, is it a keyword? Is it an int? Is it, you know, whatever, get some information about it. And then we'll say, okay, now move on to the next token. And it'll figure out what the next token is. Right, so we can just like in a loop say, get the next thing, get the next thing, get the next thing. Um, and we can go through the tokens one by one that way. Um, you could also make a version that, like the way I wrote it up here is as a list. You could write, write the code in such a way that it actually creates a list of tokens. Um, that's a good way to do it too. The, the way that we're gonna do it, I, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna follow um, pretty carefully the way that the book kind of recommends to do it. Um, and the way that they recommend to do it is um, this way, where it doesn't actually construct a list, it's just like you can just ask, keep asking it for the next thing, and it'll move on to the next thing. All right, um, cool. Let's do it. See that? Is that big enough? Okay. So we're going to make a tokenizer class. And um, well, let's just when we create a tokenizer object, um, what do we need to give it? We need to give it um, oh there's always the self thing over there. No. Doesn't it have the self? Yeah. It's been a long time since I've taught 150. Um, Uh, what do we need to give it? Well, we need to give it the actual text that we want it to tokenize, obviously. Um, I'll just call it text. Um, and we're going to want a couple other things. Um, I think what we're going to do, just, just to make it kind of generic, um, we're going to give it a list of keywords. Okay, so it's like, here's the words that if you see this word, this is a special word and it shouldn't be a variable. Um, so we'll give it a list of keywords. 
Um, we can also give it a list of symbols. Um, this one is probably not as important, honestly, because we can just, in this case, we can just say, hey, if we see a character that's not anything else, then it must be a symbol. Let's return it. No, 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 we might as well. If we see a character that's not in, in, you know, in one of those lists, then we could return an error, for example. If they're like, I don't, I don't know what this character is. If you try to give it like a, you know, an at sign, it's like, no, I, I don't know what at is. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll just say self dot text. We'll just, we'll just save all these, right? We don't really need to do anything. Um, and the other thing we need is that it's going to be keeping track of a current position, right? So we've got our text, our input text, and it's going to kind of be keeping track of where are we currently, so that every time someone says, you know, get me the next token or like go to the next one, it knows where we are and it can move on. So we're going to initialize self.pause to zero. So this is the current position in the text. This is the allowed viewers symbols. OK. Um, and there's different ways to do this. The way that I usually like to do it um, is that we maintain the invariant that every time that we read a token, we, we go ahead and eat up all the white space after the token. So if you, know, if, if, like, uh, if you have the word if, and then a space, and then the parentheses, when you get the, the if token, you immediately read past the space, and then you're kind of waiting at the beginning of you know, whatever the next thing is. Um, why do it that way? Um, one nice thing about that is that you can tell if you're done or not, because if you read the last token and there's spaces after it, you will go ahead and go past those spaces. And then you, you'll you'll see, oh, I'm at the end of the in, I'm at the end of the text, so there's no more tokens. Otherwise, if you if there's spaces, you don't know whether there's another token coming after the spaces or whether there's just spaces left. Right. Um, it also means just like when we go to read the next token, we can just look at the current character and see immediately what the next token is going to be. Um, however, uh, that means, well, there could be spaces at the very beginning too, right? There could be spaces before the word if. So the other thing we're going to have to do in this init function is just say, skip any spaces at the beginning so that we're ready to read that first token. Okay? So we're going to make a function called skip white space. So get ready. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let's write that. So how does this work? Well, uh, the thing that makes this interesting and not entirely trivial is comments. Because comments we are thinking of as a form of white space. You wouldn't, I mean, white space typically implies just like spaces, tabs, new lines, right? But comments, we're ignoring them too. So if we see, you know, uh, if there's like space, space, and then like slash, slash, blah, 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 and then some more spaces, and then a new line, and then like two more slashes, and right? We should ignore all of that. We have to skip past all of that stuff, um, you know, until we get to the first thing that's not any of those things. So. This is not as simple as just saying, oh, like, let's look at if we see spaces, new lines, tabs. Just skip those, right? We have to be willing to skip those as well as any comments that we see. Um, and we might have skipped, like, multiple times. So we're just going to make a loop. Um, so we're going to say, you know, done is false. While not done. Um, well. Um, So one thing we can do is if the current character is actually like a space character or a new line or a tab, then we can just move on to the next character, right? So that part is easy. So if uh, self.text self.pause, right? So the current 
character is always self.text, self.class. Um, if it's a space character, so in Python I can say dot is space. Is it like this or is it? I forget. Yeah, there it is space. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to deal automatically with, um, you yeah. know. Spaces, tabs, and even dealing with new lines is a little tricky because uh, we haven't talked about this because it's not really relevant to this course. But depending on what operating system you're on, new lines can be represented in different ways. So, like, and some of you may know this, but on like on Linux and on Mac OS, um, a new line is represented by a single character, which is the line feed character ASCII code 10, I believe. Uh, on Windows, it's actually represented by, by a pair, pair of characters, um, a, a, one of those line feed characters and a carriage return character, just like codes 10 and 13, and I forget the order, um, which is kind of a holdover from typewriters. Uh, when, you, when you're typing something and you want to go to the next line, you have to both move the carriage back, so you're at the beginning of the page, and then also move the page up the line. So it's a carriage return and a line feed. Anyway, uh, so it's just historical fun there. Um, so if it's a space, then we don't care about it. So we're just going to say self dot pause plus equals one, and we're not done. We we, we 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 might not be done. So we don't set done to anything. Okay. Um, otherwise, um, that's going to skip any spaces that we see. We have to deal with comments. It's the only other thing we have to do. So basically, I'm going to say if I see a slash slash, um, then I'm going to skip stuff up until the next new line character. Um, so um, you might say, think something like this. So self dot pause. We'll do a slice self dot pause plus two. Right, so this would slice out the current character and the next character after that. Um, what, what would be the problem with doing this? Or the potential problem? Cookie? Uh, I guess we could go out of bounds at the end of it. Exactly. If we happen to be right at the end, you know, self.pause might be valid, but self.pause plus one might might be past the end of the thing. So I really have to say if self.pause is less than the length of self.text minus one, I guess, and this is annoying, but there's really no way around this because we have to make sure that, um, that we're not gonna read out of bounds. So so if we're not actually all the way at the end, um, and the next two characters are a slash slash, um, then what do I want to do? Well, at this point, I just want to say, all right, just keep incrementing the position until I see a new line character, or until like, we come to the end of the file, or the end of the text, right? Because maybe the comment is the, was the last thing at the end of the text. So I want to say, um, so first, let's set the position to right after the slash slash. And then I'm going to say while, uh, while self.pause is less than the length of the text, and um, self.text, self.pause um, is not equal to a new line character. Um, and I think this will work even on Windows because I think it's the, the backslash R comes first, I'm pretty sure. So we'll just read past that and we'll see the new line here. Um, there, I can do it all in the line. Okay, so this is going to keep going until it either sees a new line character or it reaches the end of the text, whichever comes first. Um, 
And if it stops at a new line character, that's okay because it's going to then go back to the top of the loop and it'll see it's a space and it'll skip that too. But then it'll be ready to read whatever comes after that. Um, that's it, right? So, whoops. Oh yeah, did you know that while loops can have an else in Python? Fun fact of the day. I learned this when a 150 student did that, and I was like, your program is not valid. Obviously, you can't have an else in a while. And then I ran it, and it worked. And I was like, what? <laughs> it has something to do with like catching exceptions thrown in the middle of the while loop or something. I don't know why you would ever do this. So don't. But, but go look it up if you just, anyway. Yeah. Um, OK, so otherwise, it means that we're on something that is not white space or a comment, so we're done. Um, that's it. OK. Uh, oh, I should. OK. Um, let's see. How can we test this? Um, Okay, so I'm just making, I'm just going to test this quick. So I'm making a tokenizer object with this text. It's got a bunch of spaces and then a comment and then, you know, some more spaces and the word hi. Uh, actually, you know what, let's just to make it more exciting, let's make another. Two comments in a row, All right? We just we should deal with that uh, just to make sure. So then I'll say, uh, E dot um, I'm just going to reach right in that object and yank out its pause and print it out. Um, let's see. Actually, call me. Thirty-three. Does that seem reasonable? I don't know. Uh, you know sure. what I should have done is said t dot text t dot pause. H. Good. All right. So it skipped up to that H, and it's sitting there on that H, ready to read that mm -hmm. high token. OK. Cool. Progress. Right. So on your project, you know, you can use this as a start. You're going to have to also deal with multi-line comments. Um, and I think that's really, yeah, I don't think there's anything else in terms of the white space other than the multi-line comments. Um, okay, so so now we can just define, uh, we can make a function called, you know, has more tokens. And has more tokens is very, very easy if we follow this invariant that we always eat up any white space after each token, because now we're just saying, are we at the end? Um, we just say return um, self.pause equals length of self.text. Right? If the position is equal to the length, that means we have gone off the end of the text and we're done. Um, and all right. Um, so we're going to make some, uh, I guess I'll make them out here. I could make them in the class, but. Um, 
I'm gonna make like some just some constants. So it doesn't really matter what numbers these are. Um, so first I'm gonna make some constants to represent the different types of tokens that we could have. Um, symbol is two, identifier is three. Again, it doesn't matter what numbers I assign to these. The point is that uh, I'm gonna have a function that says, you know, what's the current, what's the type of the current token? And it'll return one of these. And that it means that my code can just say, you know, if token type equals symbol, blah, blah, blah. I don't have to say, oh, if it equals two or something. Um, it just makes it easier to read the code. So, so arbitrary constants to represent um, token types. And then we're also going to have some arbitrary constants to represent uh, keywords. Um, so we only have one keyword, which is let. Um, and you know, I could, because I'm, these are separate kinds of things, I could just start over at zero here, or I could, you know, I don't know, I'll just, I'll start at 100, who knows, doesn't matter. Um, you will have many more keywords, so, you know, there's there's a list, there's a book, there's a bunch. While, if, class, constructor, all right, there's a bunch of them. You don't have to have constants to represent keywords. I think it's a nice way to write the code. Um, but, uh, all right. So, um, so I'm going to make, uh, all right. So let's make an advanced function. And uh, this is just going to get the next token. And it's gonna um, so read the next token and uh, consume trailing white space, um, and it's going to set the variables uh, self dot uh, token type and self dot token. So self dot token is just going to be a string representing, you know, the piece of the input that is. Um, the token and token token type, of course, is going to be one of those four things, so we know what kind of thing it is. Um, okay. So, looking at the types of tokens that we have, any ideas? Like, how can I kind of figure out which type of token I have and you know, how far it goes? What what might be a way to start? We can start it. Ints. Start with ints? Okay. Why Why do you say start with ints? Because we can just do, this is a digit and then keep going until it's done. Yeah, good. I agree. So, ints are easy to identify because they're the only token that can start with a digit. And this is, this is the reason that variable names can never start with digits. Because otherwise it's very difficult to tell whether something is going to be a variable name or whether it's going to be, uh, you know, a, a, a number. Um, so yeah, if we just look and say, look, is the current, the current character we know for sure is not a space or a comment or anything like that. Um, it could be like a symbol or it could be a number, it could be, you know, it could be any of these things. If we look and if we see if the current character is a digit, then for sure we're, we're, we're looking at an int token. And then I think what you were saying is at that point we can just have a little loop that just says, well, just keep reading digits as long as you're seeing digits um, and then stop when you get to something that's not a digit and that'll be, that'll be our int token. So, cool, let's do it. Um, so we're gonna check for int tokens first. So if, and by the way, uh, actually, I should put this, right? This should, um, should only be called if has more tokens is true. Okay, because I, I'm not, we don't need to work out, I'm not gonna check to make sure that self.pause is less than the length. Um, I'm just assuming that you don't call this advanced thing unless there is another token waiting to be read. Okay. Um, and if you try, it might crash as soon as you read. Um, so if self.text at the current position, self.pause, um, is digit, and I'm pretty sure I got that right. Uh, wait. Yes. Uh, 
then uh, we're gonna, what are we going to do? We're going to say um, while. Well, what do we have to say? What, what should our loop say? I guess while the current thing is a digit. Um, but here we also do have to check for uh, that we haven't run off the end of the text. Because again, like the, a, a number could be the very last thing at the end. Um, so while self.pause is less than the length of self.text and self.text self.pause is digit. It's annoying that I have to repeat this this condition, you might wonder if I could just, instead of having an if, just have a while. Um, the problem is if I just have a while loop, I don't know whether it, it might execute zero times or it might execute one or more times, and those, those are different. Because in one case, I got a token, in the other case, like I didn't see anything, so. Um, okay, so as long as we're inside the text and we're seeing digits, we're going to, uh, so let's make a variable here. Uh, well, we'll just say self.token. We'll reset it back to the empty string, and then we'll say self.token plus equals self.text. Self and then we'll say self.pause plus equals one. There's other ways you could do this, right? You could kind of remember what the starting position was and then just iterate pause until you get to the end, and then just like do a slice of the text to input that in token, rather than like adding character by character. That would be fine too. Cool, yeah. Can you explain what that self.token line um, is? So self.token is just a, a variable, a field that we're going to use that's going to store the current token. Um, so we set it back to the empty string, and then as long as we're seeing digits, we're going to keep appending those digits onto our token variable. So at the end, that token variable is going to have the whole, you know, all the digits. Does that make sense? Um, okay. Uh, one other thing we have to do here, which is to set the token type, um, because now we know that it was int, so we can say self dot token type. Okay, um, and then at the very end, after this if, there's one more thing that we want to do. I mean, we'll, we'll have more. We'll have like some else ifs, but at the very end, there's one other thing we want to do. Anyone remember what what we need to do? <coughs> Increase position. Uh, well, we were already doing that. We were increasing the position here. I don't, we don't need to increase it again. Well. Oh. We need to eat white space at the Exactly, right. We need to remember that we, we always need to maintain this invariant that we're going to, um, what did I call it? Oh, skip white space. I don't know. Skip is so bland. Let's say eat. <laughs> oh, no, no. Okay, and then actually, let's before we come back to that, let's just make a couple things here. That's like uh, um, let's make some getter methods. It's like um, and then what your book suggests doing, and uh, I, I have a rant about this, but. Um, you have to give them self. What was that? You have to give them self. Get the what? You have to oh, give Oh, yeah, you're right. I can rant about that too, but that's entirely irrelevant. Um, so, right, so this should only be called. So basically, the way you do use this. You say advance, and it says, okay, I now know what the next token is. You can ask me about it if you want. And then you're like, okay, what's the current token type? And it says, oh, it's int. 
and you're like, okay, well now I know that I can call int val, and it'll it'll give me back an actual, not a string, but an actual int. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to say return int of self dot token, because we know at that point that it's actually all digits, and it's safe to convert it to an int. Um, my my rant about this is that. Um, like for those of you who are in functional programming or if you've done any programming in a language like Rust uh, or Haskell, like really what we're doing here is we're kind of like simulating algebraic data types in Python um, that really we should say, oh, a token is either, you know, it's an int token which contains an int value or it's a, you know, something else which contains this. But we're kind of like poor man's uh, version of that where we say, well, you call this function to find out which kind it is, and then like depending on which kind it is, there's one of these functions that you're allowed to call, but don't call the other ones because you know they won't they won't crash or something. Um, it's kind of a stupid way to do it, but I don't know of a better way to do it in Python um, or Java because they don't have some types. All right. Um, so we've handled. Uh, yeah, let's let's test it actually. Um, so this had better print, well it won't say int, it'll print one I guess, right? And then if I print out t dot int val, it should say uh, 33. And also if I print uh, t dot text of t dot Pause, it should print the H because it should have also consumed the space after the 33, right? So hopefully it'll print 133H. Um, so let's try it out. No, it crashes. All right. Uh, self dot token type. No tokenizer object has no attribute token type. Uh, Set it right here. I wonder if it's because you didn't do it reinitializing. I didn't do. What, what did I not do? Put them in an init function. Well, oh, I didn't call advance. Oh, well, that's why. That makes sense. That would also be why. Yeah. Yeah. You okay? Yeah, that makes more sense. You can't. And, and actually, I think it's fine. I don't know what would you set them to in the initializing, because like there is no current token yet. So, um, you just. It's another one of those things where it's just like don't do that. Serves you right. This is a terrible way to design APIs, right? It's like there's all these hidden gotchas and like things can blow up if you don't call them exactly the right way. But sadly, there are many APIs that are like that. Um, and uh, part of the problem is just that programming languages don't give us enough abstraction to be able to define better things. But um, let's try this. Yes, 133H. Excellent. All right. Moving on. What kind of token should we handle next? So now we've handled ifs. Symbols. Symbols? Can we do symbols next? How would you tell whether something is a symbol? Well, it's not a character, not a number. Or it's an or symbol too. Right. So we could, yeah, yeah. Um, we could do that. If we're going to be testing whether something is not a letter, then why don't we just test if it is a letter and handle identifiers first. Uh, and then anything left over has got to be a symbol, right? Um, just because, like, there's a lot of possible things that symbols could be. Well, it could be anything in here, I guess. Um, but identifiers and keywords, like, we know it's going to be a letter, which we've got a built-in function that will check for that. Um, typically, it can have underscores, too, right? So we can check for that also. Um, so let, uh, yeah, let's do let's do uh, identifiers next. So and what's the difference between an ident identifier and a keyword? How can we tell the difference? Well, they look the same. We'll just read in you know characters and stuff, and then when we get to the end of it, we'll just check and see if it's one of our one of the keywords we know about. Um, and if it's not, then uh, Actually, you know what? 
I, this, I should not do this. Um, there's got to be a better way to do this. Well, I'll leave it in for now. I'm thinking this is going to be annoying, but well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, all right, so uh, else if self.text self.pause um, is alpha, I believe. There, there, there can't, there's not possibly like a is identifier. Look at that. That mean? Return true if this string is a valid Python identifier, false otherwise. Nice. Um, I guess we could use that. Uh, no, nah, let's not. Is alpha, there's is alnum, if it's either an alphabetic or an under uh, number. Um, it doesn't deal with underscores, but, so we'll just say or self underscore. What, what, what are you doing? Why is it, why is it doing that? What's, what's, do I have a syntax error somewhere? Is it upset about the comment? Just, just my editor is confused about indenting things. Fine. Um, okay, so if we see uh, a letter or an underscore, it's going to be very similar actually to the int case. We just have a while loop now that's going to look as long as we see letters, numbers, or underscores, we just keep reading to the end, right? So. is less than the length of self.text and self .pause. is alnum oh you know what okay uh, is id char going to make this into a function. Um, then I don't have to type out that self.txt to self.pause thing multiple times. Um, okay, well, we haven't run off the end of the text, and we see an identifier character, and we're going to add it to the token, and we're going to increment our position. And then we're going to finally set our token type to be identifier. Oh, why did I have an SMA? That was weird. Right. Okay, uh, let's try this. So, out of range. Oh no. We messed up. Where was it? Uh, Self.txt, self.pod, 124, eat white space. Oh, our eat white space doesn't properly check when it runs off the end, I guess. Oh yeah, you see that? <coughs> because the, the identifier high was actually literally the last characters in the input text. And then, so now our current position is here, right off the end of the string. And then we called eat white space. And eat white space doesn't check for that. It just looks at the current character. It tries to look at the current character. 
So that's actually a bug in our eat white space. So that's good. Um, <coughs> Did you say and has more tokens? Um, yeah, yeah. I'll just say and. Wait, has more tokens is totally wrong. Yeah. Equals. Why is that? Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> All right. I don't know why I wrote equals. Um, okay, so I'm just, I'm just adding this check to that loop in the e-white space, so, um, three. What does three mean? Identifier. Oh, it's an identifier, right. Perfect. Um, and I can say print t dot. Yep. Sweet. And I guess, you know, we'll say like Well just, you know, just to be consistent. It's like if the token type is identifier, then you call the identifier function to find out what it is. But in that case it's just returning you the token. Um okay. Okay, but uh, this is not quite right because we have to check whether it's a keyword, right? So we're just kind of assuming at this point that anything we see that's letters and numbers is an identifier. Um, so I guess we have to do that right here. So we have to say if uh, self.token is in self dot keywords and this is where uh, well okay that's fine that's self dot yeah this is this is why I was saying this is annoying actually to have like special constants for keywords. This is like, it's definitely the, the nicest way to do it kind of from a software engineering point of view. And it would be the most maintainable, et cetera. And, and you'd have fewer opportunities for, um, for bugs or if you added or changed mm -hmm. keywords, et cetera. But it's just gonna be annoying because we're basically gonna have to look through, we'd have to like give it maybe a dictionary that says like, how keyword strings map to, you know, what codes they have and stuff like that. So I'm just going to say, you know what, forget it. If it's a keyword, you can just ask for the keyword and just give you a string. And you can just say, oh, is it equal to the string if, whatever. At least they'll tell you that it's a keyword. Um, but we won't have, like, special codes for them. So let's test this by, I gave it an empty list of, keywords, but I can say, uh, you know, let is a keyword. Um, so this should print let. Yep, zero. I think zero means it's a keyword. Yep, and it said let. Okay, good. Um, and then just to check, let's say let underscore five. It should say, no, that's an identifier. Yep, it's an identifier. Okay. Um, all we have left is symbols, but symbols are easy at this point because we just say um, else. And it depends on how careful we're going to be about this. Um, so, okay, I have to say self.token equals self.text, self.pause, and self.pause plus equals one. Um, now, I guess, right, I was giving it this list of symbols as input. Um, I'm just going to get rid of that. If we wanted to be more careful, right, you could, you could give it a list, and here it could check. 
and say, you know, is this symbol actually in the list of allowed symbols? And if it's not, throw some kind of error. Um, but right now, we'll just say, look, anything else is a symbol. Um, yes, Simon. So will all symbols just be a single character? Yes. So uh, in Jack, that is the case. And it's, it's uh, made that way on purpose so that it's, this is easier. Obviously, real languages don't, don't have that restriction, right? Um, it's not that much harder. I mean, basically, you could just say, you know, as long as you see things that look like symbol characters, keep going. And then, you know. um, it gets tricky when you have things like, you know, if you can write, so for example, in Java, you could say x is less than <laughs> negative 2 with no spaces. And it actually figures out that the less than minus is not a single symbol, but it's a less than followed by a negative. So to really do that the way that modern languages do, it, it requires some careful, being a lot more careful. But for our purposes, we're just going to say, look, anything that's a single character, or all, symbols are only single characters, and they don't come bunched together like that. And, yeah. Don't forget to remove self dot symbols. Don't forget to remove what? Self dot symbols. Self dot symbols. Where is that? Oh, thank you. Um, Maybe it's a little silly having like these different functions identify a keyword symbol that all just return the token, but I guess it means like if in, in the in the future you wanted to change, for example, you're like, no, no, I actually do want to represent keywords as special codes. You know, you don't have to change anything. You can just change the way that the keyword is implemented. Um, but um, okay. Uh, no, in it. Oh, I, I uh, forgot to remove that list of symbols. Woo. Two plus. Yes. All right. So I should be able to do something like this. Um, if I now say like, uh, you know, let x five. Um, I had like my example. X5 equal Y plus 99. Uh, and then like let Z Y plus 2 times X minus 7, X5 minus 7, like this. So I could just say uh, while T dot has more tokens. T dot advance. And then I'll say uh, if T dot get token type is an int, then we're just going to say print T dot int val. Else, we're going to print out T dot, well, I'm just going to cheat here. Just for testing it. Um, really, I should have like an elif elif if it's like. Um, there we go. So let x5 equal y plus 9. And um, yeah. Cool. Any questions at this point? Yeah, no. So we only ever end a line with a symbol when we're going we through the... only ever end a line with a symbol. Or like the file will never end with like an, an integer or a character, it'll only end with a symbol. In a valid Jack program, I believe that, yeah, you can never, it'll always end with a symbol, but I mean the tokenizer shouldn't care about that. Um, because, well, here's one reason. Even, even if you have an invalid Jack program, if you can turn it into valid tokens, that helps because you can then generate a better error message. Because the error message is now at the level of, this is not a validly structured Jack program, not you used an invalid character, right? Those are kind of different error messages. And if you, 
it, you don't have to try too hard. Like write a Python program or a Java program and try making some deliberate errors, and and notice like the different kinds of errors you get. Some kind, some types of errors, like if you write, you know, x plus minus divided by three, you'll get basically a lexing error, a tokenization error, where it says like, I wasn't expecting to see a, a divided by sign here. Like this doesn't make sense. Whereas if you like, you know forget a, parent, a closing parentheses or something like that, you're going to get a different kind of error where it, it tokenized it fine, but then it wasn't structured in a valid way. Um, other questions? So the one part that we didn't get to um, that is you know part of the project is how do you actually output this? And so um, the way it wants um, it wants you to output it is as XML. Actually, you know what? Like, I think I can do it in a minute. So, say print. It's basically like we're outputting XML, um, which if you don't know what XML is, it doesn't matter. You can read about it. I think it's tokens. So it's going to be a closing, an opening and closing tokens tag, and then basically each thing in the middle, you're going to say, um, you know, something like, uh, something like this. So I'm not going to do it for the other token types, but you can imagine what it's going to look like. So this is the, the output that you should produce. All of these should say, you know, you know, this should say symbol, you know, like bracket symbol, semicolon, close bracket symbol. This one will say keyword, you know, whatever. Um, you can read about what you're supposed to do, but basically the tests assume that you are your tokenizer is going to output something of this form and then it provides like some comparison things. It's like here's the correct output, and you can compare yours to see if you're giving the correct output. Okay. But that's, I mean, that's kind of the easy part. Once you've got the tokenizer written, I mean, obviously I just did that in like, you know, 10 seconds, so. All right, cool. See you all on Thursday.